and it was so nice to see lots of old friends and hopefully make new friends. I'm Ravi Barrett. I work, I'm a urologist and I work at the World Free Hospital. And I've been asked to talk about biopsy and active surveillance. Um, because we're quite a big centralized system at the Royal Free, we tend to do a lot of everything. So uh, I actually do a lot of surgery and very little biopsy and active surveillance, but I guess, uh, uh, I guess uh, that's what, um, what I've been asked to talk about. So um, we're going to start with a quiz. You've seen uh, my slides already, but um, following on from Dr. Clark's talk, um, we use radiology quite a lot in diagnostics, and you know, this is where some of you can progress, and you can see that there's a white breast lump here. And the question I'm posing to you is how many breast surgeons would do a mastectomy or a lumpectomy just based on that CT scan? And the answer is zero. Um, if you look at this slide over here, this is a CT scan showing a, a right color, yeah, a right mass in the, the, the colon. And how many colorectal surgeons would do a right hemi for this without getting any tissue before doing it? The answer is zero. Some of you in the audience may do prostatectomy. And how many of you would do a radical prostatectomy just based on this MRI? The answer is probably zero. And yet we're more than happy to consider operating on a kidney just based on these CT scans over here. And we're more than happy doing that, knowing that 20% of what we operate on is going to be benign. That there's an up to 20% complication rate from renal surgery, especially from partial nephrectomy. We know that there's an up to 5% conversion rate from partial nephrectomy to radical nephrectomy, so one in 20 patients. And this increases the chance of CKD in those patients. And the surgery that most of us perform, robotics or laparoscopic surgery, is really expensive. So it costs anywhere between 4,000 to 16,000. Sorry, we're passing the slides. Um, so it's kind of crazy that we're still doing that. So we have to ask ourselves, is it ethical in this day and age to still indiscriminately treat all small renal masses as if they're the same? We know from Dr. Clark's brilliant talk just now that the detection of small renal mass is increasing. We also know that benign masses do not necessarily require surgery. We know that overtreatment of benign small renal masses exposes the patient to unwarranted morbidity and mortality. And we know that the overtreatment of the small renal mass is expensive. And can we afford this in the post COVID era where we know there's 5.8 million people waiting to get into theater? Um, and we're over-treating people perhaps by 20%. And this is data that hopefully all of us have seen before. This is our data. This is the Baus nephrectomy audit, and this is from a paper done by Archie Fernando at Guy's back in 2016. Um, and it showed that out of the Baus nephrectomy data that 18% uh, of all nephrectomies that were done for small renal masses were benign. So this is what's happening in the UK with our patients. And actually the patients that we characteristically thought we should definitely be operating on are the ones that perhaps we should be thinking the most about. So the under 40 year old where we'd say, yes, you definitely need surgery. 36% of those, those masses were benign. And if they were small, 29% were benign, small meaning less than 2.5 centimeters. And if you combine both, so in a, someone who's less than 40 and who has a small renal mass that is smaller than 2.5 centimeters, 44% of those masses were benign. I don't know if that's ethical. So what are the reasons why we do not routinely biopsy renal masses? So there's a few myths which I'm hoping to show you aren't necessarily true. So the first is that biopsy isn't accurate. Um, uh, the second is that biopsy isn't safe. The third is that biopsy makes surgery more complicated. We also think the biopsy may cause seeding. And that may be a reason why we don't do it. And probably the most common thing and the common prejudice that most urologists have is, is coming out anyway. So what's the point in doing a biopsy? Um, so this is a systematic review and a meta-analysis published in European Urology about five or six years ago. Uh, it looked at 57 studies, over 5,000 patients. They showed that the median diagnostic rate um, uh, from a biopsy was about 92%. So uh, it is something that is uh, accurate. There is good subtype concordance. What it's not great at doing is uh, telling us about the grade. So the grade concordance is probably only about 
but it gives us a fair idea. Um, and there's a very, very low rate of pain in two complications. So the, the, the rate is uh, somewhere in the order of about 2%. The other myth is that renal mass biopsy um, makes surgery more complicated. Um, and all of us have probably done partial nephrectomy, or some of us have done partial nephrectomy, and we've noticed more difficult and more challenging dissection around um, the area in a biopsy tumor. But this paper over here um, comes from the Canadian sort of consortium from Ontario, and it looks at all patients undergoing both partial nephrectomy and radical nephrectomy. Um, uh, in Ontario between 2003 and uh, uh, 2015. And renal mass biopsies were done in, a, excuse me, were done in a proportion of them. Um, and essentially the biopsy was associated with a small increase in operative time, um, but there was no difference in the complications. And there was actually a decreased likelihood in undergoing surgery for benign disease, which is ultimately probably most important to the patient. The next question that arises is whether or not biopsy causes seed seeding. And in the literature up until a few years ago, there was a blanket answer, no, it doesn't cause seeding. That's probably because people weren't doing that many biopsies and they weren't looking for seeding. Um, and then the Oxford group here, uh, Mark Sullivan um, and Lisa Browning, they published this paper in, uh, in uh, European Urology a couple of years ago. And they went and they looked in their biopsy series for those who then were converted into having surgery, they looked for tumor seeding in the biopsy tract. And they found seven out of 173 cases, and this was 4% of, uh, of their series. That seems like a relatively high number, but how many of those actually had a clinical consequence? And there was one patient who subsequently got early recurrence and actually died within 24 months. But this patient had grade four PT3A type 2 papillary renal cell carcinoma, probably one of the most aggressive um, uh, subtypes um, uh, uh, of pathology. So was it really, the, was the clinical consequence due to biopsy seeding? Or was it due to the histological subtype? And this is essentially what we see um, in biopsy seeding. You have the tumor here on the left. Uh, there's the pseudocapsule next to it. And you can see the area of fibrosis over here um, with islands. Um, and in these islands of tumor, what really causes someone to get multiple widespread recurrences throughout their body, or is it the biology of the disease? So the authors, uh, Mark Sullivan, doesn't really advocate deviating from guidelines on biopsy, and they acknowledge that in larger series, specifically looking for seeding, that none was found. And we've seen seeding in our series too. So we've done over a thousand renal mass biopsies at the Royal Free now. We've probably seen about eight cases. And the only one that has had a clinical consequence with early recurrence was a very similar case to the Oxford series, high grade, high stage, um, uh, papillary renal cell carcinoma who developed an early recurrence within, within six months. So we're looking at about a one in a thousand rate of patients who've had biopsies actually leading to a clinically consequential um, outcome that may be different. Um, these are the data from uh, our series. This was um, presented at EAU a couple of years ago. And essentially it shows that our series is consistent with what's published in larger ones. Um, uh, we have an overall diagnostic rate of 87%. We have a low complication rate. Most of them are related to feeding, um, but all of them are fatal to or lower, so 2.6% complication rate. And this graph here is weaker than the rest of it, which made us um, change our practice. It looks at the diagnostic rate, the malignancy rate, the diagnostic rate in blue, the malignancy rate in uh, orange, uh, based on the size of the world, size of the massive of the files. And you can see here that our diagnostic accuracy is actually very low in masses that are below two centimeters. So now we've changed our practice and we no longer recommend uh, doing a renal mass biopsy in our center for masses less than two centimeters just because it just puts the patient on this pathway of perhaps getting a non-diagnostic biopsy um, and it and essentially increases anxiety when we know the natural history from my previous slide on BOUS um, uh, shows that, that, that these are often benign. And this slide over here tells us about how we use biopsy to guide management. So I'll just talk you through it for a couple of minutes. Um, so this is where we've done about 500 biopsies. 
after the first biopsy, 412 diagnostic types of games in one diagnostic search, basically 17 in the second. 39 of those went into the second biopsy, again, 34 of those were diagnosed in the second biopsy. And when we looked at the patients who then had a benign histology versus a malignant histology, there's a huge change in what they chose to have as their treatment. Uh, for their spleen and rats. So a lot of the malignant patients had surgery and bioablation, very few had surveillance. And if you see over here that the benign um, patients, the overwhelming majority chose to have surveillance um, and uh, you had bioablation as um, surgery. So 98% of the patients with the benign biopsy did the surgery. That's pretty big when we do about 400 infections a year. Um, so it makes a big difference to the volume of patients and the quality of care that we give. So what do the guidelines say about this? Um, they're pretty vague. Um, they haven't really changed over the last four or five years. But they say that we should be performing a renal tumor biopsy before ablation. Makes sense because we need to know what we're ablating. Um, and also before systemic therapy, of course, we need to know um, uh, uh, what kind of tumor we're treating before we give them some therapy. It also says perform a percutaneous biopsy in selected patients who are considering active surveillance. Um, but interesting, interestingly, over here, we have use of biopsy before ablation, we have use of biopsy before systemic treatment, before active surveillance, but there's no real discussion about what we should do before surgery and how can we use biopsy to guide uh, whether or not a patient has surgery and what kind of surgery we offer them. So who do we biopsy? So we biopsy, as I say, pretty much most small renal masses, uh, most patients are offered um, renal mass biopsy, except those who have tumors that are less than two centimeters. Cystic tumors remain a challenge because the yield from an FNA is much, much lower um, uh, than, uh, than from a, a or true cut core biopsy. Um, uh, and antero superior tumors are also very difficult to access. So obviously you may need to go through the pleura, through the liver, and these are associated with a higher um, risk of complications. And there's clearly no need to biopsy patients when the result will not influence the outcome. Um, so even though we said that in young patients who are in their 40s may have a high risk of or a high chance of having benign pathology, um, some of these just want surgery anyway. They want to move on with their life. And clearly, there's no point in biopsy in those. And looking at the other end of the spectrum, the 80-year-old comorbid patient who's unfit of any, for any intervention is not really going to change what you're going to do. So the point that we're trying to make over here is, is that actually if your practice is just that we do surgery or we do watchful waiting, then a biopsy has no place in your practice. But the management of a small renal mass is changing, and we have to use biopsy, in my opinion, intelligently to guide which form of treatment is best for the patient. So we know that surveillance, ablation, and surgery are available for the treatment of a small renal mass. In surveillance, it can help us tell the histotype in the brain, and it could guide the frequency of scans and also plan for how long we need to follow up um, small renal masses. We now know that the natural history of certain histological subtypes is different from others, so chromophobes, oncocytic neoplasms, are nowhere near as aggressive as perhaps a type 2 capillary RCC. For ablation, it may help in... Uh, uh, guiding the interventionist to how big an ice ball or a thermal ball that they would produce after uh, after doing it. If you had a more aggressive histology, maybe you would be a little bit more radical in your ablation technique. And in surgery, it's certainly useful for us, especially when you have the four centimeter tumor that's central. Is it CT one B? Is it CT one B, CT one A, or is it a CT three A? Um, uh, and it can help us um, uh, when we're doing more complex partial nephrectomies. Um, which is increasingly becoming the case, um, it can guide us in, in, in how we, how we, uh, what technique we use, so whether or not we would enucleate or whether or not we would do a resection uh, with, a, with a wide margin. So I've also been asked to just talk about active surveillance. I've got a couple of slides on that. There's actually very little that the guidelines say, which is rather surprising because 
again, we know the natural history of a lot of these small renal masses is usually very indolent. Uh, we know from trials that have been tried on T1A renal masses, you won't see differences in cancer-specific survival or overall survival for 10, 20 years. It's analogous to 3 plus 3 or 3 plus 4 prostate cancer. And whilst there's a lot of literature for prostate cancer on active surveillance, there's not a huge amount um, uh, for uh, low-grade kidney cancer, sorry, for, for T1A kidney cancer. So uh, all that the European guidelines say is, is that this should be something that's offered to frail and or comorbid patients with small renal masses. This was a review that was done by Tobias Klatt, um, uh, and he did a systematic review that was published in the BJUI this year. Um, and they looked at the pooled analysis of um, uh, essentially all patients who had undergone active surveillance with a fo minimum follow-up of three years. So there were 18 cohorts that they looked at, and the number of patients pulled together was 2,066. The initial pooled size was 2.8 centimeters. The median follow-up was 53 months. So that's pretty, you know, a uh, pretty long-term intermediate slash long-term follow-up. And they found that only 2.1% over a 53-month period developed metastases. And in the cohort that were less than four centimeters in size, that was only 1.8%. Now remember, if we're doing a partial on the T1A lesion with negative margins, we quote them similar um, uh, uh, survival and cancer sort of specific survival um, uh, figures. Um, there's a reflection over here of what the population was like. Only 1% of them died of renal cell carcinoma. 22% died of any cause over those 53 months, indicating that it was quite a comorbid population anyway. So they concluded that active surveillance is safe in the intermediate and long-term management as an intermediate and long-term management for uh, well-selected patients uh, with localized renal masses, and that it was even better with small renal masses. And certainly what we do at the Royal Free um, is that we now have a cohort probably of about 350 patients who are on active surveillance that we're following prospectively. Um, uh, 150 of those have been biopsied, so we know the exact histology for them. And there is actually no recognized protocol for active surveillance that's described in the literature. So the one that we follow, which is based on the kind of best evidence, is that we have a baseline CT chest and triple phase uh, renal protocol CT. We do six month renal CTs for the first two years. If the lesion is stable or decreasing in size, we then go to yearly renal CTs. And if the lesion is growing at any rate, uh, then uh, we continue with six monthly uh, renal CTs. Now the progression criteria that we use, the most common reason for moving to treatment is patient anxiety. Um, uh, and that's something that you have to be frank with your patients that at any point they can move on to an active treatment, the choice is theirs. Um, uh, a size greater than four centimeters, we think, is a reason to intervene. Um, and a growth rate of greater than five millimeters per year is also a reason to intervene. Although the growth rate has been shown not to be predictive of aggressive or refining pathology. So to conclude, um, biopsy is safe and accurate um, and does not complicate surgery. It can be used intelligently to guide the modern management of the small renal mass and active surveillance is a safe management strategy in select patients with small renal masses. Thanks very much.